Welcome to Ask DDO Cast, a one-off special where DDO Cast members will answer your questions. I am Ann Trent, your moderator and hangout organizer. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure everyone is ready and familiar with how this works. If you have a question, you can ask us in the following ways. One, comment on the section of the hangout event or the YouTube video page. Two, you can reply to at DDOcast on our Twitter account using hashtag DDOcastQ. And three, you can post a reply to on our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash DDOcastKobolds, all one word. And finally, we have a IRC chat channel located on our website at DDOcast.com slash chat. If we air your question, we'll send you uh, one of many prizes, which include a DDOmotou t-shirt, uh, dice for your role-playing games, a drow miniature assassin, and uh, of course many DDO buttons and uh, DDO temporary tattoos amongst the mix. Today's panelists are Siegfried Trent from DDO Cast, Jerry Snook from uh, Turbine, aka Cardovan, uh, Patrick Sherman from aka Shamgar from a- Epic Education, and TC Dalbeck aka Ekerik from Premium Perspective. Uh, take it away, Sig. Uh, So what we're doing today, very unstructured, no gaming news, no special events, uh, but just guests and people coming on the show to ask questions, and uh, the people, a panel assembled, will try to answer them as best we can. Uh, And uh, barring questions, we will chit-chat about this and that and the other thing, whatever people find interesting, and we'll be giving away prizes. So anybody who comes and asks a question will win a prize. We have lots of prizes. Um, So I think that's about it. Uh, Do we have any questions to start off with? Okay, Anne has a question. Uh, oh, Anne's busy at the moment. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's see. Um, I do know we have uh, update patch 2 coming up. Um, I'm guessing uh, that Cordovan might know a little bit about that. Uh, Indeed. Kind of, my question for you is uh, kind of what, what are some of the highlighted items in the patch uh, patch 2 is largely bug fixes. Actually, it's all bug fixes. And it's uh, already on the Mania. So if you want to, well, part of it is already on the Mania. We're actually going to be, uh, barring any last minute issues, we're going to be updating the uh, patch uh, early next week, even uh, cool. with some more stuff. So, uh, But it's all bug fixes. Uh, really, it's just a matter of trying to, you know, as uh, Fernando Pies, uh, DDO executive producer, said in his producer's letter, really kind of trying to focus on those known issues. And so we're uh, doing as much of that as we can uh, for cool. both the last patch and this patch and update 16, frankly, and maybe even farther than that. I mean, obviously, we'll be, we always try to do bug fixes in the patches, but we're really dedicating some time to that, uh, some extra time, I should say, mm-hmm. uh, to that these next few patches. So um, really, it's uh, several dozen uh things, some big, some small, you know, some are going to be things that's like, oh, about time. Uh, some of them are, are frankly minor, but, you know, you, you try to tackle a, a wide range of various things. So yeah. uh, we have, uh, I know one that people were talking about that's in there is the, uh, when you search in the adventure compendium right now, it blanks out your quest list. Oh, uh, yeah. That one's going to be in there. Um, I can't say that we have fixed all issues with Epic Destinies, um, but... We may, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where if you if you're having a little bit of a difficulty finding all the reasons why something might be breaking, you can't definitively say that you've solved it because you don't know if you if there's you know maybe an edge case that you're not aware of. But we've uh, found it looks like at least uh, two reasons why this is taking place and are going to be addressing that. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be making a big dent in that. And it was already a, a, a relatively small percentage of people affected by it, but obviously if it was you, it was a pretty big one. So um, I don't know. What else uh, do we got? We did really just would need to look at the uh, known issues list. I could call those up quick on the Mania. And That's we have okay. quite, a, quite a few things uh, on there as well. But those sure. are maybe a couple of the biggies. Yeah, just uh, start it off. Have we got another question? Oh, you won a prize, Jerry. I'm not sure what, but uh, you oh, probably nice. <laughs> You get a Lotro horse. No, I don't know. <laughs> awesome. Made of diamonds. And then, <laughs> made of diamonds. We've been playing Borderlands 2 a little bit lately. It has some very funny dialogue in it. Nice. That's a, it's a very fun game. I, I recommend that, especially you know if you've got a friend or a beautiful wife that you would like to play a game with. It's a fun one to, to partner up and play. It's very yeah, fast-paced, yeah. kind of fun. Yeah, I've actually, uh, you know, I, I do have a little bit of a soft spot for my first-person shooters, and 
Uh, I've been recently getting into another one that's uh, free to play called uh, Blacklight Retribution. If you're oh, yeah, yeah. That's a really fun mm-hmm. one as well. But yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard really good things about uh, uh, Borderlands too. Yes. Yeah. We've got a question, Mighty Curator. Or anyone want to jump in with one? Oh, okay. And still working. And yeah, still working. <laughs> Well, I guess I could say, you know, we did have uh, the Maybar Festival of Endless Night this past week, so uh, thanks to everyone who checked it out, and if you didn't check it out, obviously that's a sign that Maybar is coming uh, pretty darn quick here. Um, yeah, that was over on the imagine Lamania, right? October, and we'll have more details about exactly when, but uh, that'll be going up to level 25, it has updated versions of the uh, current loot in Maybar, and you know, some new monsters and stuff to kind of bring it up to level 25 as well, so... Yeah, and when you jump into the killing zone, you can kind of pick which level range you want, right? Yeah, and right, exactly. Yep, yep. Which is different than before, where you're just kind of in there with everybody of whatever right. level, and, and the Comet Fall people might steal all your, your thunder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I might have been one of those people, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think we all were a little bit, yeah. yeah you know, Maybar is great for your clerics out there. If you're a cleric, Maybar is awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the items were updated. Those look pretty good as well. I, th- I thought there's some neat stuff on the items that uh, that were added in, like yeah. kind of level 24 versions of the epics and stuff yep. like that. So yeah, they're incremental neat. upgrades, you know. So it, it's not uh, not a huge new loot list, but it certainly if you have a high level stuff and you like this gear and Maybar, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna like the level mm-hmm. 24 version of it as well. So. Yeah, and there's still a kind of a free for all zone as well. It looked like from the. Mm-hmm. From the selection list, so yeah, you can get in and and do what you did before, or you can get a little bit more exclusive uh, level range for for the area. Right, right. Yep. Uh, if you want, I can still talk a little bit more about patch two. I was I uh, called up the release notes. There's a couple of good ones in here. One sure. I know that people have been asking for the radiant servant uh, will now work uh, function regardless of whatever your currently selected target is. I know that that was one that people have been looking for for a long time. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's really, I'm looking at maybe almost two dozen bug fixes for epic destinies of various shapes and sizes. Uh, That's kind of a big one. Um, Oh, I, here's a minor one that has been on the known issues list. This is an example of maybe a, one that's been on the known issues list for quite a long time that's just now getting fixed because it's minor, but it annoyed somebody, obviously. And that is the big top bandana is going to be red again. <laughs> that one has been in there for quite a long time, if I recall correctly. Maybe even before when I was hired. So that's I funny. remember talking about that one. <laughs> So. Yeah, I know as a programmer, it always feels good to get in and, and have some time to just work on old bugs. And you're like, you know, this puppy's been around long enough. It yep. needs to go. I'm yep. I, I guess finally I could uh, bring up that some of the loading screen tips that were a little outdated have been removed, and they've added in some new ones as well. You know, that's kind of one of those oh, that's cool. long things. Not a huge issue, but it's just something that's really been needed to be done for a little while now. So they're, they got around to that. So. Oh, that's cool. Very nice. Yep. Anne's ready is is that um, a number of people have been reporting issues with uh, lesser um, reincarnation, uh, missing items such as like pets and um, I think yeah pets purchases and and um, special prizes like the snow club cub that you know they, they got things like that when they LR. So what's the status of that? Uh, well, there's a couple of those are. A bunch of different issues, but uh, so first off, I guess I could say about the cosmetic pets, or not cosmetic pets, creature companions. Um, recently, those who were affected and filed tickets on it uh, did get uh, some temporary uh, reimbursement uh, from our support staff. Otherwise, what they're working on right now is a not only a long uh, a solution to basically grant everyone their pets back, and that's. Uh, basically going to be done through a fairly complicated automated process that is still being worked on a little bit, so it's not quite here yet, but the idea will be that you will get your stuff back. And just need, unfortunately, to be uh, be a little bit more patient on it. I know it's been a long time for some folks, um, but you will be getting your pets back, long and short of it is, and we'll be doing that as soon as we can. And we're really just working out the tools to be able to support that effort which, uh, you know, figure out which pets you had, which ones are missing, how to grant them back, and all that sort of thing. So it still is taking a little bit of time, but I know it's something that they've actively been holding meetings on 
really for for a couple of months here at this point, and, and doing some various dev work and back and forth to get that that able to be done. So so that will be done, and uh, you just have to unfortunately be a little bit more patient as and wait for us to uh, make a formal announcement as to how that's done. But if you are affected by this, the way to make sure that you're taken care of is to file a support ticket to account store support. You can go to support.turbine.com, go to the support center, and then click submit a ticket, send it to account store support, say, hey, I'm missing my creature companions. If you know specifically which all ones you were missing, that's great. If you know about when they went gone, that's great too. But just whatever information you have, make sure you get it into the uh, support folks and they'll work with you to, to get this issue resolved. On the Epic Destinies, uh, we kind of I hinted that not one a little bit earlier. We have a couple of fixes in patch two that should take care of a few of these. Uh, one in particular where it could cause an issue if you crash in the middle, like let's say your client crashes in the middle of an LR. Uh, there is a small chance that that could cause an Epic Destiny XP loss. Uh, that should be addressed now. And there's one that uh, is not currently in the release notes, but you'll see very shortly. Uh, as well, where they're changing a little bit of the process to hopefully address some of this issue. What it's going to do is, um, it's really not a, something you'll notice while you're LRing, but sort of behind the scenes what's going to happen is you're going to get auto-granted all of your XP up front, rather than sort of it calculating it by level. So uh. you'll still be going up by level, but in terms of the behind-the-scenes sort of coding process, it's just going to front-load all that XP for you. And, and the idea is that would hopefully, you know, prevent any disconnections or numbers not adding up, you know, as the, through the process there. So, um, you know, again, that's not yet in the Lamania build, and that will be very shortly. And of course, you know, it's a little early to, to say definitively that that's going to solve the problem. But the idea is to certainly at least take care of that for as many cases as they can. So, and cool. you know, like I say, you don't know what you don't know. So it could very well be that there's some sneaky little buggeroo out there that just has not yet been identified. But hopefully, uh, we will be taking care of that as much as we can. So that's the direction I was looking for. So thanks. Yep. yep. Cool. Uh, anybody got a DDO question that's <laughs> online with us? I got one here. Uh, oh, okay. See if anybody might look. be able to answer this. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I'm sure for people who follow me on Twitter, you know that I've been going through all the um, older Epic content to figure out what the XP is for all of them now. I've been noticing there's very little difference on those from Epic Normal, Epic Hard, and Epic Elite as far as the amount of base XP. Um, does anybody know, is this, and I haven't done Epics before a couple weeks ago, so I have no clue. Um, does anybody know if this is like because you know the content was originally just there was one epic and maybe they're they haven't been able to spread out the difficulties on those yet? That's just my guess. That's interesting. I haven't actually seen the XP breakdown. I was actually uh, okay. looking forward to seeing your XP chart there. So can you give an example okay. of what the actual XP difference is? Yeah, sure. Like, um, okay, let's say uh, I've got here in Demon Sands, we've got Chains of Flame. Um, Epic Normal is 17.822, Epic Hard is 18.134, Epic Elite is 18.446. So you're really only around uh, 300 XP difference on each of those. Right. Um, you know, from one level to the next. So I don't know if, if maybe, because um, like, uh, you know, Druid's Deep, um, it, uh, there's a much broader range between, say, Epic Normal, Epic Hard, and Epic Elite <laughs> as far as the XP. I didn't know if maybe it's because they're having to go back and maybe revamp those to make it, you know, to where Hard is actually a lot harder. <laughs> I'm not in a position to answer that one because I, I frankly don't know, but it's it's interesting. It's I bet somebody does know. It just, I don't know. Yeah. So, didn't know I'm if guessing, anybody had a clue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing somewhere there's some kind of design guidelines they have for experience yeah, yeah. points and difficulty levels. But it may uh, be applied, I don't know, unevenly between older and newer content or, you know, somebody who's working on a pack. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking, interesting, I'm, I was trying to think of why might you do that? And sometimes I do notice uh, in the game that people will 
you know, grind something or do something because it's XP efficient, and then they kind of complain about it, right? So they're like, well, I can't get really good XP unless I run Epic Elite, but Epic Elite is too hard for me. So I can see perhaps that having a, a more egalitarian XP curve uh, makes some sense because people feel like they don't have to run the more challenging content if they don't want to, and there's still some incentive there, but it's not quite as gigantic as it might otherwise be. So you still care if you're really into optimization, but you won't necessarily feel like you're severely handicapped because you can't do the hardest content. Um, I don't know. And and also, yeah. perhaps, they're compensating a little for all the bravery bonuses and whatnot that you get for Hard and Elite, and uh, just <laughs> trying to keep that from multiplying into the stratosphere. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, like I said, I just noticed that with Druid's Deep, there's more of a spread on what the Epic XP is um, between normal, hard, and elite. Um, yeah. I don't have those actual numbers, uh, but those are on the. I know they're on the DDO wiki already. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I've always, you know, that's one of the things in the game that I've always found a bit mysterious. Sometimes I was like, which quests are worth how much XP, and how those decisions get made, and some mm -hmm. of them certainly be, seem to be very easy for the amount you get, and others are very a whole lot of work for kind of a pittance, as it were. But um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would almost see, you know, maybe if you took kind of an economic approach, if you, I mean, because they certainly know how often quests are run, and then they sort of can automatically adjust the XP values based on the market demand for a given quest. So, I don't know. <laughs> Supply kind of and demand for XP. I love yeah, but then it. you can right. game it, right? Then, then people, people grind. Like, yeah. <laughs> you grind one quest too often, its stock goes down. You know, yeah. <laughs> give it some time. Yeah. I don't know. That sounds a like a lot of, of work, quests. but it would be neat. <laughs> I've been running a lot of Epic Quests. I, I tend to, as well, have been running a lot more on Epic Hard than Epic Elite, but I have been doing some Epic Elite. It's hard to say. I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm my characters are not nearly a, as great as some, some people out there. The Uber Elite are just run circles around me, but I'm not terrible. So I've been mostly duoing uh, with a couple of, a friend or two of mine, uh, Epic Elite Quests, or Epic Hard Quests, rather, so... Yeah, Anne and I do epic hard most of the time unless I'm playing a bad character and then we do epic normal on, on the level 20s. I have some characters that are weaker than others, shall we say. So, yeah, epic elite I haven't done much. I know my guild does, but I haven't done very many of them with, with them yet. I feel comfortable doing epic elite with my characters on, in, a, in a full team, um, but you know, just solo or, or duo, nah, usually I can't quite handle it. Well, has has any of you actually done some of the older epics with, or you know, done them both on Epic Normal and Epic Hard? And have you noticed a difference, much of a difference in them? Uh, yeah, I think we might have lost Epic there. Parison, pardon? Oh, he's back. Okay. We lost you for a moment, Eckert. Oh, sorry about that. Now, um, what I was asking is, any of you actually? Um, some of the uh, epic quests that you were in there before the expansion, and, um, you know, have you gone back into some of those, run them both on epic normal and epic hard, and noticed any difference in how, how hard it is? I have. They're definitely easier. Yeah. Uh, so, like, uh, if you if you went on a particular one, uh, there is a difference between the normal and hard. Oh yeah, on, the... on any one quest. The normal is definitely easier than a hard. Hmm. Okay. I would think you'd get much more uh, XP than Epic XP on the hard then. Yeah, I don't think that the jump is as big no. from normal to hard as hard to elite, but it's definitely No, it, it's certainly not. Normal and hard are pretty close together, uh, but elite is definitely a lot harder than any, any of the other two. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Also, I'd say you know, for a little while there were some bugs where Epic Hard, the boss monsters were really easy. They just didn't scale right, but they fixed that. So for a little while, Hard was actually easier than easy because of that. Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have a good time in there. I like it. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I like the difficulties a lot. Yep. Have we got any other questions? I there was one from Chad. I don't know if Anne, if you wanted to uh, see that. Did you see that one from a uh, uh, Mr. Peterson there? Oh, yeah. um, any thoughts on the uh, Mayhar Rogue to Joseph trade or vice versa for uh, TRs? Oh, 
Sorry, my thing went off. <laughs> Anyways, I'll repeat the question. Any thoughts on the Maybar robed doesn't trade for, or vice versa for TRs? This is from Byron Peterson, who's currently in the G, G Plus hangout with us. Uh, I'm assuming that question might be for me. <laughs> uh, the, answer, uh, the answer would be uh, any thoughts on it? Um, I haven't heard of any sort of uh, efforts to do that. You know, it's like any kind of uh, feedback. Uh, certainly, it's it, you know if there's a enough desire to do it and it fits within sort of their design goals, you know I'm sure that they'd like to. Do. Uh, yeah. I have not specifically heard about a item direct item to item trade for Maybar items, or frankly any of the other uh, items as well, like say Cove or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I suppose you know who knows. I would never say never. Yeah, it would be cool. You know, I think that would be a nice thing to add because certainly that's been an issue sometimes. You can naturally see it with ones where there's an equivalent, where the you know the robe and the Dawson are essentially the same, which is the case there. But it actually, you know, okay. yeah, it, you know, it might save you guys in the long run in a way if you had an ability to turn any armor into a Dawson or the Dawson back into the equivalent armor. Right, you could have you could make less items in the long run, right, and and still yeah. have the players enjoy I, them uh, really. I don't. I'm, unfortunately, I don't think I'm in a position to say uh, to discuss that oh, no. particular issue. But let me say, I did corner one of our item guys <laughs> one day and and tell him uh, a lot about that exact issue. Cool. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it might be have been described as talked his ear off about it, uh, <laughs> and uh, but unfortunately, I I just. Don't think that that's in the uh, plans, at least short. Yeah, oh, that's all right. If, if memory so serves, uh, Anne said that she would give cookies to the dev that did that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I promised a bottle of scotch well, too. I did say I would give cookies to the dev that actually did them. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bounty, but uh, yeah, we won't hold our breath. There's definitely an interest in it. I just have not, um, you know, one one. I guess I wouldn't say that this is the reason not to do it, but one issue, one uh, sort of thing to consider with uh, docents is that they don't have, say, light, medium, heavy. Right, so yeah. essentially, if you make, um, you know, one one armor type will will work. So if you were, and some some items, some armors that are not docents may be somewhat weighed in terms of their abilities and powers based on the type of armor it is as well. So you would yeah. remove that aspect of it were you to have, say, a conversion mechanic to turn it into a Dawson. Now, I'm not saying that couldn't be addressed or dealt with or maybe not even really an issue, but, but that may be one concern. So. Yeah, it's a decent argument. I mean, if you had a light armor and it's statted for light armor and you move it over, but right. I guess you know, it's just the challenge of Dawson's. That's the way they were made. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. No, I could. There's definitely things that, especially turning it back into something else, right? What kind of armor would it be? Heavy, medium, or light? Uh, yeah. I guess the option. Well, well, then we pick, and it just starts to get more complicated at that point. So mm -hmm. easier to go to Dawson than from Dawson, I suppose. Yeah. You have a. If I were to speculate, you have a similar mechanic, in in how we create uh, unarmed weapons for your pets. So such as I think is like either the collars or something like that. For for converting hand wraps into weapons for them, so right. I, I guess it it'd be something like that. It's one way you can't go the other. Right. Cool. Yeah, I guess there is a little bit of that technology out there in the way you make pet collars and stuff like that. That's a good point. You know, um, Brian does mention in the chat as well that especially with the one in the Maybar, they have identical properties. So something right. like that might make more sense than say, you know. Uh, you know some of the armor, other armor types out there. So right. that's a really good point. Definitely. Yeah, and yeah. you guys did with the uh, the I don't know, I forget the name of the the Forgotten Realms Town, whatever that place is called. Uh, Evening <laughs> Star. <laughs> Evening Star. There we go. Thank you. Somebody I'm sure knew. Yeah. Um, you know, you had kind of a system for docentizing the armor uh, mm -hmm. benefits, which I thought was cool. Right. Brian gets a prize. All right, Brian's gonna get a prize. What is he getting? Do we know? Oh, okay. He gets to choose a prize, so that's cool. <laughs> um, I don't have a list of them, darling. Um, but we have T-shirts. We have uh, little drow miniatures. We've got codes for um, some stuff. Uh, I know there's some Lotro horses. Uh, I think there's also maybe Winterwolf and uh, some other things as well. Um, assassins. We have little drow assassin miniatures. Um, buttons. Um, I can give you a DDO cash shirt. 
a Lotro, no, yeah, a Lotro Rohan shirt, a a Menace of the Underdark shirt, um, extra large only. Uh, we have a couple larges, and then a um, the old school with a flick of a wrist, you know, um, monk DDO shirt, uh, uh, and dice bag with dices, and of course, thousands upon thousands of DDO tattoos. Oh yeah, we've got some tote bags too, right? Yeah, like three of those. Bags. Yeah. Cool. If you want cookies, I make those too. But uh, yeah, we might not want to mail those. Uh, and you know, you'll probably get a DDO cast button as well, that sort of thing. We will need you to tell us where to send stuff to, um, and and we'll record that. Yeah. yeah so I guess that's the best thing. We'll we'll take emails now, and then we'll sort out the details later. That usually works pretty good. And we have a Menace of the Underdark uh, Collector's Edition thing apparently, uh, but we'll have to figure out a special way to give that away. Maybe we'll, maybe all the people who get prizes, someone will be picked. Uh, to get the special prize, that might be a good way to do it. Sounds like a good good plan. Yeah. Hey, I heard Shamgar on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm looking for a way to um, uh, solve the monastery puzzle, Shamgar. I know how to solve the veil puzzle now without the solver. Is there a way to to translate the the technique? Um, for the monastery puzzle, the monastery puzzle is basically the same puzzle with buttons removed. Uh, so you can kind of try the same technique. Otherwise, practice. Practice, got you. It's not so, really a. Yeah. You kind of learn how to do it a little bit. I mean, it's, sometimes I can do it in about three seconds, and other times it takes me about twenty minutes. So it just kind of depends. Yeah, it's I don't want to put you on the spot four. there, but can you give me a quick rundown as to how you would approach, say, the the monastery puzzle there? Uh, well, the way that I do the shroud puzzles is you pick a, a top row, whichever row you, you want. Uh, you just name one the top, and then you step on the button that's below any unlit button, uh, and that lights your top row, and then you repeat that process all the way down. Uh, and then when you get down to the bottom, there's uh, there's only a set number of... Uh, permutations that you can get for the bottom being unlit, uh, and then that will tell you which buttons on the top row to hit to, uh, and then you do the same process and it will solve. Um, basically, I kind of do the same thing with the monastery puzzle, although it's a little bit more freeform, and I'm kind of looking more towards actually solving the puzzle. Like if I step here, then I know that these ones are going to change. If I step here, I know that these ones are going to change, uh, and you just kind of Go. I tend to go kind of clockwise-ish, um, more so than up to down, depending on the puzzle. Just because, at my experience, it usually ends up being sort of circular. Uh, and then I try and if you, there's often like one little button that's kind of stuck off to the side, uh, next to another another button. I try and get it to that point so that uh, the the one kind of off to the side is unlit and then uh, get the one next to it being unlit too, and then you can solve it that way. You should kind of look for areas that it would be easier to to get a solution out of if you can get everything else lit. It's kind of the long and short version. Yeah, sometimes I find that, um, you know, I'll be staring at the thing and I just can't figure it out. Other times I come out and I look at it and I see two moves and I move, move, and then it's solved. So what I'll do is if I get stuck, like if I'm spending longer than a couple minutes on the thing, I'll just run around on it and randomize it and then look at it again. And then sometimes the solution appears to me, as it were. Um, so if, you know, because sometimes I just get into a pattern that for whatever reason doesn't make sense to me, right? I don't see a way out of it. Uh, and then randomizing helps me get a new, a new set to work with, and I can often figure out how to solve it from that. So it works for me. I, I once had the guy solve it for me. He comes running out of the room, yeah, I'll do that jumps on too. the puzzle, it solves, and he dies. <laughs> nice. nice job there, Mr. Drow Scorpion. Way to go. Nice. I guess you know the only other tips I'd have for Monastery, and these are kind of obvious ones, but one is to, if you're not solo, of course, to have someone else kite the guy around because he will sort of run over the puzzle and mess it up for you. Uh, the other thing is to not have summons or, like, say, Iron Defenders or that in there because they can <laughs> kind of be a bit of a hassle, you know, running over your tiles and that as well. Mm -hmm. But I guess, do you ever it try also helps to have wait? a high save? Uh, yeah, right, right. 
Do you ever try to wait for, say, one of them to blow up, so to speak, so that you can sort of work around it? No, oh, then you lose XP if you do that. Well, yeah, but you get it solved. You know. <laughs> what well, blows that's up no in there? fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, <laughs> if, you, uh, if you damage him enough, uh, uh, one of the buttons will lock itself on, uh, so you can't step on it anymore. Right. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and... if you do it enough, right, like you could theoretically blow up every button. That's how you would actually kill him. Oh, okay. Uh, so you can do that uh, if you're having trouble. It'll lock one button on. The problem is you can no longer step on that button uh, to actually uh, un like use it to solve the rest of the puzzle. Yeah. So I generally try and avoid that. One, it it makes the puzzle harder to solve. I think if you if you get the wrong button. Uh, locked out. Like I've literally had a button get locked out, and it makes the puzzle unsolvable. Uh, so you have to lock out another button, and then it hmm. you end up trying to have to lock out like half the buttons just to get the one unlocked that you need, so you can solve the puzzle. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, any more questions? I got okay, I Anne's got one. Tons. <laughs> Good. Um, so, uh, I think it was in August, uh, Mad Floyd said that they would re be reviewing the challenges, uh, and their experience points rewards that they give. Um, when, when do you think that will happen? I'm <laughs> I guess that's a Cordovan <laughs> question. <laughs> right. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I have not, uh, heard anything further about that from Mad Floyd or anything else. Um, that's not to say that it's not being worked on. Uh, I'm just not aware of it, uh, if it yeah. is. I, I would need to, you know, be in the office and, and track them down and ask them, and and I just haven't done that. So, does anyone have a like, um, you know, amongst our our group here, like which ones should be looked at? I'm not sure. I don't I don't run a lot of challenges. I usually do the ones that are really short, like that don't take very much time, uh, and I don't usually do like the 30 minute ones. So I'm not sure which ones are worth more. I would generally say though, like the longer it takes you to do the thing. The more it should be worth. And say, what? How do people feel about the XP challenges right now? Like the XP that, that they give. The epic XP seems to be pretty good, uh, particularly the newer ones. Uh, if you run all of them and get like five stars, even on like level twenty-five or lower, I think it comes out to be. Oh, I think I know the Grove one. It's like a hundred thousand for the the ten-minute one, or seventy thousand for the ten-minute one for five stars. And uh, mm -hmm. about half that for the five-minute one. And they're all kind of about the same XP to minute ratio. Even the old ones are pretty good too. Yeah, I've I've never really run one and been disappointed with the XP I got, unless you know, unless I failed to complete it, or sometimes if you just get one star but you were in a really long one, that that can take a while. But um, but you, usually I feel like I'm getting my time's worth out of it and, and you know, having a good time doing them, too. So. I mean, I, I'm guessing this Not is in relation to, um, you know, some of the, the the scaling back that was done. You know, some of those challenges we're offering, you know, about half a million XP, 300,000 XP <laughs> per run, and they were scaled back, you know, for balance reasons. And so I believe that comment may have been made in relation to that. Is that correct? I, I'm trying to go back in my, my head, just off the top of my head here. You know? I think it was after that. I, you know, they did it, and then they were like, you know, some people complained that some of them were low, and they were like, well, we'll come back and take another look at them at some point. Uh, so I think it was after they reduced them off of their sort of meteoric level, um, and they were just taking a, they were going to take a look after that. I think the biggest problem, and and what that was really kind of uh, addressing, was the the mat ratio, the materials ratio for like the arena challenges is a lot lower than the other ones. Uh, and even uh, Cobalt Island seems like it's lower than uh, the other ones as well. You um, crack. Other was oh, I need to that. kick somebody out of the... Yeah, I think that's someone Oh, okay. Hey, um, Anne got... Uh... Okay, yeah, Anne got booted out of the DDO cast thing. Uh, so mm -hmm. somebody needs to drop uh, if anybody has finished asking their question or something so she can pop back in. Okay, somebody went out. That's an interesting idea. So what what's going on? I've never actually seen this with a G plus thing. I've never had this many people, and it automatically <laughs> booted you out. Is that right? Uh, I have no idea, but she she crashed.
And so if you're not actively talking, I'm going to probably ask you to leave. Please. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Everyone's welcome, but yeah, you can rotate through. Uh, yeah, if if you've finished uh, asking whatever question you came on for. Okay. Uh, cool. Have we got uh, another question? Um, uh, Paul on uh, Twitter asks, um, "How do we win the menace of the dark T-shirt?" Well, basically, you can ask any question, whether it be on, on so Twitter. Just how to win the T-shirt? <laughs> just to win a T-shirt. If you want to win it, just just ask like ask a question. If we answer it. Um, since we have a lot of T-shirts, we'll 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 probably give it to you. <laughs> yeah, I think you just want a T-shirt there, Paul, for asking how to win the T-shirt. If you're asking about the menace of the underdark key that we have that we have currently today, thanks to Jerry. Um, what I'll do is, if you want the key, um, it, we'll en we'll enter your name in a pool because it's a it's a fairly cool prize, and we want to make er let everybody have an equal chance of getting that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was thinking of all the ways you could do that badly. Going, all right, the last question we got, that wins the grand prize. And then everyone waits. And they're like, okay, I'm going to wait until the very end of the show. I'm going to ask a question then. Now, first question, yeah, no, there's not a lot of good ways to do those except something. The worst random. question? <laughs> yeah, the worst question, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Encourage people to ask terrible questions. You can deem which one is awfulest. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> Why do the devs hate paladins so much, right? You know, <laughs> no, 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 that's absolutely not true. I know they don't hate paladins. I know. There's that, you know, it's, yeah, both Gen Con and Pax, the, it was the paladin, uh, well, or the the uh, barbarian, then ended up taking home the prize. So. Oh, oh, for the, um, yeah, for the challenge? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who thinks that hasn't played a good, hasn't played an awesome paladin. No, actually, yeah, I, I think about the best out there. <laughs> yeah, I like my paladin a lot now. Actually, the epic destinies really made him, um, it gave him a little more meat on his bones. Hel right. Helped him specialize in that survivability stuff. So, um, yeah, I like my paladin a lot actually. Yep. But you know, that's just the classic thing that that people will say is, "Why do the devs hate X?" Right, whatever it <laughs> happens to be that they that they feel is perhaps not as great as they want it to be. Really, what they're asking is, why do the devs not love my character as much as I love my character, and why can't they give me more fun things? <laughs> exactly, yeah. There you go. <laughs> why can't I be the strongest? <laughs> cool. Uh, more questions? <laughs> oh, well, we're filling a gap. I've got one. I actually recently okay. LR'd my Artificer. Uh, you know, frankly, I've been LRing my Artificer um, every week I can uh, mm -hmm. just be, as part of this epic destiny issue just to oh, see right. if yeah. what happens to me. And uh, it hasn't, by the way. I've never had a single issue after about, what, four or five LRs now. Um, and But I have all of a sudden, uh, you know, kind of been tweaking it a little bit, playing around since I, I'm doing it so much, right? Um, one of the things I was uh, I did recently is I picked up Archer's Focus uh, during this last run. I'm not even sure how I got Archer's Focus, to be honest. I didn't have it in the last LR, and then suddenly it showed up. So I must have done something different this time. But, it's uh, free with uh, Precise Shot. Okay, if, see, I had Precise Shot. That's why I'm not sure what, what happened. You probably well, it didn't notice it's new. collapsible. Yeah, it's a new thing, and it's, it's like collapsible in the feet. Mm -hmm. Right. Something like that. So. so long and short, my question is, is it worth it? Is it awesome? Or is it something you should just ignore? Well, if you're uh, only shooting one thing, then yeah. I mean, it, it it doesn't go... You can't use it and improve precise shot at the same time. But uh, No, like, really? Oh, no. Yeah. It's one or the other. That explains why it showed up. Because I must have dragged... I've got improved precise, right? And so, but I must have dragged precise shot to my hot bar, and I've got that one targeted now. And so there we go. Now all of a sudden, uh, as of you know, yesterday afternoon, all of a sudden I was like, what, Archer's Focus? What the heck? No, there there, there yeah. are two different range stances. Uh, so improved precise shot, you know, you can shoot anything that your arrow is going through. Uh, right. and you can hit as many things as you as you can get in a line. Which I can uh, attest after months and months of doing that, that that is the way to go. Yeah, yes. but if you're only shooting one boss monster, for example, then you don't need to shoot through anything. You're just shooting the one thing. Uh, an archer's focus will give you a, a stacking uh, bonus to range damage, 
for a time so long as you, one, don't move, and two, don't use uh, many shot. Although I have no idea right. if Endless Fulisade would uh, knock you out of that stance either. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I have been using Endless Fusillade, but I have not seen the, say, negative Archer's Focus show up. But like I said, this just started yesterday afternoon for me, so maybe I just <laughs> haven't noticed it yet. It'll, um, show up in your, it'll show up in your buff bar, the same icon that uh, the feet is, uh, okay. and then it'll you'll get a little counter on it. So it'll have like the one or the two, kind of like uh, the monk, uh, the grandmaster uh, counter does. Mm -hmm. It has a little number on the bottom of it. Same thing. So you'll see uh, how many counters you're on for it. I think it goes up to five, and it's like 5% damage for each one. Right. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. I mean, I, I noticed that it's not terrible, especially uh, when you, say, combine it with Radiant Force Field, because it'll help, you know, let's you stay there and absorb the damage a little bit easier. So, I, you know, I'll be, say, putting Ablet of Armor, uh, Stone Skin, Radiant Force Field, and then, you know, stand still and basically just act like a turret a little bit, you know, in some of the uh, heavier fights there. But I, I just wonder whether it, it was, you know... I was mostly just seeing like 5%. I don't know. 5% is nice, but I'm not sure. You It'll know, go higher. Yeah. I mean, you get, I think you can stack it up to 25%. You just got to sit there and you can't move for that whole time. Right. And yeah, you I get can to see stand using still it. for like 5 seconds at a piece, 5 to 10 seconds to get it to count each time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I tend to kite a lot with my range characters or, or at least kind of do little tight circles and stuff. But uh, so I haven't used it a whole lot, but I've I've noticed it on there, and I've occasionally turned it on, um, just to test it out or for specific situations. Right. All right. Well, I'm probably going to stick with my improved precise shot, to be honest, because that so. is very incredibly yeah. awesome. You also have to shoot but... something consistently. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. You, the only time we're going to use it is when you're fighting a boss, and I mean, it's great if you're yeah. fighting a boss, so you can. Up your damage for that. Otherwise, or, I mean, if you're a crossbow user and you're between precise shot and improved precise shot, which you know there's a fair number of levels, well, you you will have one and not the other. Then it makes a lot of sense to use it. If you're a bow archer, maybe not so much. And to, you know, once you've gotten many shot, which you usually get a little bit quicker, um, since uh, you know it's going to turn it off, and then it's just kind of a hassle toggling it back and forth. So um, right. there are you some don't have level to ranges where on. you might as well. Oh really? It just oh okay. It just stops. No, it, it stays. It stays on. Uh, it's a, it's a stance, so it, it just stays on oh, okay. like any other stance. Uh, and when you are attacking something for the the time frame that you need to, uh, and then uh, you don't move or you don't use mini shot, it just starts to count up. When you do use mini shot, then it starts to it just goes away. The buff just oh, okay. disappears from your buff bar. I'll show you in a second here. I'm almost sure. done what I'm doing. I don't suppose <laughs> you're seeing in Maybar here, are you? That looks a bit like Maybar. Oh, are you, are you seeing it on my screen share? Okay, yeah. cool, there we go. Good, I thought I'd pop onto Lamania quick and just uh, take a little tour on my admin character for those oh, who haven't cool. seen it. So. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my admin, so that way I don't have to worry about getting hit and dying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, have, I have a question. On Twitter, Grimord asks, um, no, for, for those of you who are not uh, working at Turbine, um, you can speculate this question. <laughs> Any ideas <laughs> of when a new race will be added to DDO? Oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess probably not in the next year, but maybe, you know, within maybe, you know, year round, so 2014 or the end of 2013. Eh, I, I could see that happening. I'm guessing not for at least two expansion uh, packs, since I haven't even heard whispers of it. I know it takes a lot of art to do a race. Yeah, I would say it's going to be at least a year, probably more at yeah. this point. I figure they're going to at least finish the enhancements and get that ironed out before we get a new race. Yeah. Well, based on some of the conversations that um, had happened during Gen Con when I was there, um, you know, because I mean, there were some people asking, like, you know, so when are the gnomes coming? Because I know everybody's asking for that for the new race, but. Um, you know, it kind of sounds like the general opinion is, well, there's not a whole lot of difference that we'd really be getting in the game with having gnomes versus the races that are currently available. So yeah. it, it, it's kind of a low burner or back burner issue right now, I think, for them. 
I could see, you know, if they get the the new enhancement system running up and, um, you know, where you can kind of have different trees for your race, if they had multiple sets of enhancement trees for race, you know, so elf, you could be a moon elf, and then there's a whole set of stuff, or you could be a high elf, or, a, you know, so you could have different kinds of the current races, at least mechanically. might look <laughs> the same, but you'd have different, you know, sets of build options and stuff, so that'd be a way to kind of have some of that, uh, but, yeah, it's always fun to have yeah. new graphics. Well, I sort of have that. My epic elf archer is now a fae. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Change your creature type. Yeah. Yeah, they could do, yeah, they could, I mean, there's all, yeah, that's, one thing I do like about the idea of the new enhancement system is it, it has a modular design to it, so they could do a lot of, I don't know, playing around with it in the future. Be cool. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to see Archer's Focus, I've got it on my uh, my screen here. Ah, very uh, cool. Shooting the dummy. And you can kind of see how it works. It it pops up another uh, buff. See, there's the counter right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it ticks up. Very cool. Yeah. The What is it? There's a, a defender stance that's a little bit like that that I have on my um, on my paladin. As, as I stand still and fight, it gets better and better. Right, that's like the that's the epic moment one, right? I think so. Yeah, I forget what it's called, but um, I, yeah, it's certainly fun. I like it. Um, it. It ups my saves. My saves get up into ridiculous levels uh, if I do that. So, it can be kind of nice. Cool. Uh, we got another. Oh, did anybody else have a, a thought on uh, when a race would come? No. Okay. If there was a race, which race do you think would be next, or which race would you want to be next? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, what what do I think would be next? I, you know, I I mean, I guess gnome would be the way. You know, if if the difficulty of doing it weren't a problem, gnome would probably be the one they'd pick. It's just the most popular kind of slash common one that's out there. If I wanted to see one. Um, you know, I would love to have, uh, like, Divas or uh, Dragonborn, something with wings on it, um, I would really enjoy. That'd be a nightmare, graphics-wise, most likely, but that would be cool. And you'd also have to explain why they can't fly. Well, yeah, there's that, too. A little stumpy, <laughs> thought it was wings. <laughs> They'll have this feet list in it, in it like, called Clip Wings. Yeah. <laughs> Now, if you want to sell the race, you know that maybe you do tieflings, and then the females look like succubuses or something, and then you'll you'll sell that race like there's no tomorrow. Oh yeah, on that one <laughs> might. Uh, you'll never see a male tiefling running around. <laughs> yeah, you might take a little bit of a hit in the old respect department, perhaps. But mm -hmm. oh well. <laughs> but you might make some money. <laughs> Just. Made. Uh, or gelatinous cube druid, you turn into a human. <laughs> uh, yeah. That. Uh, I would totally buy that. <laughs> Anybody else got a race pick? I think either Tiefling would be probably easier to do because there's already a lot of the artwork in the game. Because mm -hmm. we have a bunch of Tiefling models. I think you'd probably make a similar argument for gnomes. It probably could be fairly easy in the sense that you can kind of just redirect, decorate the halfling avatar potentially, but yeah. I'm not a programmer, so that may not be feasible. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, it depends on your concept of what a gnome looks like, but yeah, you definitely could. Different kind of head. Mm-hmm. But yeah, since we don't have the Hobbit-style halflings, uh, they actually look pretty appropriate as gnomes, body-wise. Hmm, cool. More questions? Hey, it's the pumpkin head. <laughs> Yay, pumpkin grenades coming back. I like those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pumpkin oh. grenades are great. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, me personally, I am looking forward to the upgraded version of the Cloak of Night as well. Uh, yeah, that's so a really good item. It's got the damage. I don't know if you can see it in chat or not, but yeah. so it's basically ups to uh, dodge bonus three percent and dr ten uh, of slash good. So that's kind of nice. Yeah, dr ten good is awesome. I mean, that's yeah. really and it's not easy to get that kind yeah. of a permanent dr. So 
that's a very good item. <coughs> Sorry. Unless you're a tank, because then the invisibility guard kind of sucks. <laughs> like, yeah. We lost aggro again. Yay. Yeah, well, it, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, it's not for everybody, right? Yeah. You know, but it's great if you're kind of a skirmish character or a wizard or all kinds. Or of Or frankly, like my even my artificer, right? Because yeah. you know, it will, when, that's not going to hurt at all. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Because when you get into melee, what you want is to get out of melee generally, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. definitely handy. Yeah. Let's see those wraps of endless night uh, coruscating. Uh, mm. <laughs> Here's a question from our chat uh, in in uh, RC. Um, Stan said uh, asks, "Will repetition penalties be implemented for those who are XP capped? For for us who are not a part of Turbine, we can speculate." <laughs> <laughs> uh, repetition penalties for those who are not capped. Oh, We're talking I, about in Maybar or? I'm not sure. You know, I saw an interesting thread, and maybe this is kind of what they're talking about, is that there was a suggestion that um, they make um, the repetition penalties on quests, you know, so you have completed this quest X times, uh, go away or be reduced or changed in some fashion for people who have capped characters. So, because they want to grind out epic destinies, and there's a certain amount of, you know, you run out of the ability to get XP from quests. Um, if you're a character who, you know, you're not TRing, because if you TR, they all reset, uh, but you're, you know, you have to grind through a few million XP for whatever reason, yeah. it becomes a little frustrating that a, a quest pretty much becomes, you know, unrunnable for you, or at least, you know, the amount of XP you're going to get. So one suggestion was to make them more like chests where uh, that happens, but then they periodically time out. Um, or just to change it if you happen to be capped. So I think that's probably what that's about. I think it's a pretty good idea. Um, I just think, you know, it, it it's kind of a bummer, and, and I don't think the game design ever really considered that in the first place, that you would get to a point where you would stop running a quest because of that. I mean, the encouragement is to go run other quests, but with the amount of XP you need for, like, to unlock all the Epic Destinies, you'll be running down all kinds of quests, and then they just become kind of useless to you, and you can't run them anymore. So I could see that. So, no, no, so yeah. they don't need to do anything. Here's what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, once you're capped, you don't incur any more repetition penalties. Oh, really? Uh, oh, okay. So if you're capped and you've run a quest four times uh, before you got to cap, from then on you'll always have a four repetition penalty. So you'll lose, what is it, 20%? Oh, okay. Uh, if you've only run something mm -hmm. twice and you cap, you don't have a penalty. So if you uh. only run something on Epic twice, or only run an Epic quest twice during your lifetime before you cap, you don't get a penalty. I see. So then you can ah, run, okay. run something as many times as you want. But if you bank, that might be, I guess that would be a, kind of a problem for you, or it could be. No, once, um, you, once you hit max XP, you, you're done. It doesn't, oh, matter okay. if you take, it doesn't matter if you take 24 and 25 or not. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, that's not too bad then. I guess that's for people who've... Yeah, you know, <laughs> in that case, it might be people who've ground out a quest and they just want to keep grinding it out. And I'm not sure if I have quite as much sympathy for that. I guess it's okay, but but it does kind of create a meta situation where you're like, well, I, I want to make sure I don't overrun this quest until I cap, and then I can run it into the ground. Suggest yeah, then you got the min maxers trying can, uh, to take advantage of that. <laughs> yeah. I can be evil and suggest that you can you can buy tokens to pause your repetition progress. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. A store <laughs> item to reset them. <laughs> sure. Hey, well, you know, actually, I'm for anything that makes Turbine some money that isn't going to, that I don't feel like I have to buy personally. And I certainly wouldn't feel like I'd have to buy that, so I'm, I'd be okay with it. But I'm pretty permissive when it comes to that. I don't, I don't like, yeah, this is just a way to make money. Um, yeah, that's, you know, kind of what <laughs> having a game is about, generally speaking, right? Well, I'd just like to say, I think Turbine's found a good balance there. I've seen some other games that are free-to-play games or freemium, however you want to call it, and it just seems like you, you hit a certain point and it's like, man, I'm paying tons of money to get anything done here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's something I think Turbine's that, got a good balance. <laughs> it's pretty good, yeah. I mean, I feel like when I'm buying stuff from the store, it's just some goodie I, I'd like and that I don't really need, but... But, gee, I want it anyway, and maybe I feel a little silly for buying it, but whatever, it's something I enjoy, so I might as well spend the money. 
And that's that's about how I want to feel. I was playing Guild Wars 2, and they give, you get these little chests occasionally, and then it's like, you can't open this chest in your inventory unless you go buy a key from the store. And I'm like, eh, hey, yeah, that, that feels a little cheap, right? Yeah. Like, you give me something, and then I can't really have it until I... I mean, I recognize that's kind of a good marketing technique, but... <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. I didn't feel as good about that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's called you giving me something, but it's not really something I'm getting. Nah, I don't like that. So <laughs> it did eventually give me a key to open one of them through a quest or something. I was like, oh, okay, I don't feel quite as annoyed now. I can actually open one of these stupid things. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of questions I'm seeing in the chat. Some good stuff. So. Yeah, Anne's, Anne's about to launch into one here. <laughs> here uh, here's another one. Here's one from Twitter from on CSI Stormreach. What part of the realms would you and or the panel would like to be highlighted in DDO if you were given control? I'll set this one out because I don't know anything about the realms. <laughs> I know the Underdark, and we have that, so I'm I'm satisfied. Hmm. I need to look up a map. I think just to kind of take. Re- I mean, there's so much, right? Uh, Please. I, I've got an idea. I mean, you know, don't read anything into this, right? This is just me talking off the top of my head, whatever. I would kind of like to see the Icewind Dale. Uh, okay. So you heard it here first, Icewind <laughs> Dale coming in 2013. <laughs> don't do that, Dale. <laughs> right? Um, I mean, I would have, frankly, said the Underdark, because I think it's kind of rad. But in, there yeah, that'd be my first choice. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad they went there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know yeah. much about it, but I played one of the Ice uh, Baldur's Gate games, or no? It, oh yeah, it was Neverwinter Nights, and one of them was set in this weird place with witches and all kinds of strange things. And I thought that setting was really neat. I, I, <laughs> I don't know what that setting was, but it was cool. I mean, it was somewhere in in the Forgotten Realms, but I'd never heard of it before. Right. Um, that was useful. <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't know the Forgotten Realms very well. I, I was a Greyhawk yeah. guy. That's kind of what I grew up with. So mine was Dragonlance. So I really don't know much about Forgotten Realms either. <laughs> yeah, I, I've played most of the campaign settings. I too played predominantly in Greyhawk, but I did do Forgotten Realms as well. Yeah. Baldur's Gate, uh, Chromir. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I know those from the, from the game I play. But they all seem, I mean, they're kind of generic fantasy to me. I, the, the one with the witches and stuff seemed a little different. They had this whole different culture, and it had a kind of, I don't even, I guess it was sort of a Celtic feeling, but it, I don't know, it was kind of its own thing. It just, it, But it felt different than classic fantasy. There was a lot of spirit shamans and spirit creatures and, and kind of umbral landscapes and things. It was, it was definitely really different. It had its own gods and mythology. You know, looking at the uh, map, I'm looking at a map on the wizards.com website of uh, Faerun, and it would be neat to have uh, to go out to some of the seas and all that as well. I was always a big fan uh, during my pen and paper campaign settings of having a lot of boat travel. I always really liked the uh, oceans and some of the adventures you could have there. So it would be really neat to, to have a real sort of island and ocean-based sort of uh, expansive setting I think would be a lot of fun as well. Could be kind of cool, definitely. Are we in the fourth edition or the third edition version of Forgotten Realms? Uh, there's an official answer to that one. I would need to look it up. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's after right. the Cataclysm. Yeah. Would be. Yeah. So that would be that would be fourth edition, right? Yeah, I think it's pretty much fourth edition land. Although I know that you know they're planning on doing some stuff, and some of the stuff they're doing now is to set up for D and D next. So I think we're in the transition zone between fourth and and 5th edition Forgotten Realms. Yeah. yeah, I'm not qualified to answer that question. I need to look it up first. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we got another question? Uh, yeah. um, Paul Harvey from Twitter asks, how, how does the twist of fate work in Epic Destinies, please? And, how, and do you think that they are a good idea? Uh, yeah, I mean, I only know partly because I've only done a few of them. I know that you um, usually you get like four ranks in an epic destiny or so, and then you get a twist of three. fate. Three, three, okay. three, and you get a point. Okay, and can you? Does it cross over? So if you get like two and one, and then one and another, yeah, you end up with three. Point? It doesn't matter how you get them. It's every three levels. Okay, cool. Uh, 
So you can yeah. do one, you can do three, three, and three, and you get three fate points. You can do five and three, and you get uh, two. So it doesn't matter how you break right now. It's just whatever many levels. Yeah. And then there's kind of a progressive cost to them, isn't there? Like, so the first one costs you one fate right. point to unlock a level one, but yeah. then you're going to need to spend, what, two to unlock a level two and so forth? So the first, the first uh, fate slot is uh, one point per upgrade. Uh, and then, the, uh, so the first time you upgrade it, it's one, and that one fate point. That lets you put a, a level one ability in there. Uh, it takes two points to, put a, a level, to upgrade it so you can put a level two ability in there, and three for level three, and four for level four. Uh, for your second slot, uh, you increase all of those by, I think it's just by one. Okay. Uh, and then the third slot, you up, it's another one. So for your third uh, slot, it takes three points to unlock it and then uh, four points to upgrade it to the next slot. Yeah, and I think the end, the thing to say, is it's, it's really pretty expensive, right? I mean, it takes a long time to get, you know, a lot of high-level slots on there. And... Uh, I, I've focused on just having one or two. You know, I think two is the most I have on any character. So, and the thing to do is, you know, make sure that as you're kind of looking at what you want to do, if you're going to have a level one epic destiny ability, uh, you want to make sure that that goes into your third slot because it's the cheapest one on, or it's the most expensive to upgrade. So you want it to be the lowest uh, one that you can fit in there. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Strategy wise. Yeah. So, yeah, plan on having the cheap one in the, the last unlock slot. Right, sort of and, thing. and the one that's going to be a fourth level ability, you know, stick that in your first slot because it takes fewer points to do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, hmm. yeah I mean, there's definitely, for myself, because I found out how much it takes to, to grind to get them, I'm only on my characters really, like, anticipating getting one or two, like a, a level one and a level two on any given character. I'm sure I'll get more eventually, but... I, I tend to play my lower level characters more than my high level ones, so it'll be hard for me to unlock much more than that. So that's that's kind of what I'm looking for in my planning. But uh, yeah, that's what you know. I think I mentioned it on the last show. For me, it's just a little too much grind to get much use out of that system. So I'm I guess I'm a little disappointed in it. I'll probably end up in order to unlock a level two. I'll probably end up spending. You know, I'll, I'll buy a turbine thing to unlock them, um, but. Um, yeah, much more than that. Yeah, but I couldn't see going them all that way. That would be a whole lot of points, and I just I probably wouldn't spend that much on it. But just to get it's a little bit, it's actually see. really easy to to get like some baseline fate points because uh, mm -hmm. it's it takes fewer experience to to level up your destiny than it does to cap your character. Yeah. Uh, so you're already yeah. gonna kind of burn through some of that stuff. Um, and then if you're only looking to get like lower tiers, you know that's really easy to do. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just keep switching your... As soon as you can switch your uh, destiny to go to other uh, open destinies that you've unlocked, you know, if you keep switching it as fast as you can, you'll maximize how much points you get because you're leveling up lower co or lower XP cost uh, destinies. Mm -hmm. It takes... It probably takes something like... What was it, like 300,000 to, to level up the... Well, let's see, I'm on uh, rank 9 uh, of 1, and I've only got 400,000 uh, plus XP in this destiny, and it takes 1.5 to level the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it's definitely backloaded on the XP, so if you're constantly switching your destinies to your lowest level destiny that you can, you can get a lot more uh, fate points faster. Oh, okay. So they're cheaper at the lower levels on the Epic Destinies. I guess I never paid too much attention to what the, the XP cost on the Destinies. I haven't... Anne's capped one out, but I haven't yet uh, finished a whole line of one. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Anne yeah, really likes hers a lot. They're great abilities, and there's some really fantastic things that you can slot in your, uh, in your Epic Destinies. Uh, if you're a caster, uh, the Magister has a level 2 ability that increases your, des your DCs to a spell school. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can get for one fate slot, you can increase any spell of your any spell school of your choice by three DCs. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, some, 
there's definitely some nice ones. Like on my Paladin, who has healing amplification and all that, uh, I really wanted to, and I haven't done it yet, but I will pretty soon, is to get the one that just gives you um, uh, echoes of power. Um, mm-hmm. Because if, you know, if he has echoes of power for nine or something, he can throw 200-point heals on himself indefinitely. So, <laughs> you know. Kind of a, right, a small little, little ability. Echoes big... of power for low level paladins. You splash in one level of a class that has echoes of power. Well, that yeah, great. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Hey, here we go. Okay, so I, I I wanted to get an answer to the edition sort of question on forgotten on the uh, menace of the underdark. So I was able to actually <laughs> dig up our quote. Uh, from the uh, Dev Tracker. This one is from Purple Foos, who uh, does uh, really a, a lot of the the keeper of the knowledge on all the uh, where things take place. And his answer, given on September 5th uh, in a timeline quest, a post was, the events of Menace of the Underdark take place roughly 200 years after Mistra's death, give or take. DDO's timeline is a bit fluid in that earlier CR content takes place earlier, and higher CR content represents later events. Uh, we do actually try to be sticklers with the Wizards of the Coast lore, and uh, Ed Greenwood even helped uh, write you know, some of this sort of stuff put together. So, cool. um, Suffice it to say, Elminster is supposed to physically be here at this time during the events of the Darkening. The exact plot point of his resurrection is somewhat covered outside of DDO, so I don't want to put words into Wizards or Ed's mouths there. So, <laughs> well, I think I read, you know, some fans were saying how he got resurrected, and apparently it's a pretty convoluted story, but it has him occupying somebody else's body for a while, and then making, and he apparently has some sort of clone or another body that was ready, and then he transferred his consciousness from the person he was occupying over to the clone, something along those lines, so it was hmm. kind of interesting, but... Yeah. Good. I'm glad I didn't try to answer that myself because I'm not sure I would have gotten all that right. So. <laughs> yeah, and I did find that interesting that you know, like those druid quests happened before the quests yeah. that came out before the druid quests. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of curious. Yeah. Cool. Uh, get another question. Uh, Gio, Jeff Hanna. I was about to say Giovanna. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you <Hanna>. know better. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Hanna had, had a really good set of blog posts about PvP. Um, what I want to know is what people think would be a good idea on how to improve it. Mm, okay. Get rid of it? <laughs> Ooh. You're in the no PvP camp. <laughs> yeah, poor Jeff Hanna has uh, taken a lot of flack for those articles. Uh, I don't personally have anything against PvP for people. Um, I just don't do it myself. You know, I, I don't really care much for jumping into PvP. Um, you know, I like that you know, DDO has where you go to an arena to do PvP. I, you know, some other games I've played where they have you know, um, world PvP drives me nuts. <laughs> Yeah, I've never liked that much myself either, um, world PvP stuff. I, I like going in, you know, it, I really like that we have it so that we can go in and test things. That's great. But that has nothing to do with why most people want PvP. That's just, it's kind of interesting. Okay, what kind of save did you make? All right, what numbers did you get? Okay, cool. I'm going to hit you with this sword. How much damage did it do? You know, and, and that stuff is really great for testing out the mechanics of the game and stuff. Um, I don't know, you know, the, the the problem with PvP for me is you know, people get certain attitudes and they get kind of uptight about it. So I mostly do it with people I kind of respect and have fun with. And then we set up some rules and we go, eh, let's do it like this. And then we all do it like that. And that's usually a lot of fun. Um, one thing I always thought was neat, now this harkens back to a really, really old version of Dungeons and Dragons in an online setting. And this was a uh, America Online, if you remember what the heck that was. Yeah. Um, some DDO players were probably born after America Online went away. <laughs> um, but uh, it was an old online internet-like service, and they had a Neverwinter Nights game that was like the old gold box game. So it was a turn-based, top-down view, kind of grid map combat system. And they had a really weird PvP in it where you couldn't directly fight other people, but if you were a summoner character, you could summon monsters, and the monsters could fight other players. And so the only way you could PvP was a kind of chess slash battle, you know, like Pokemon thing where you would summon monsters and buff the monsters and throw environmental area stuff and they would kind of fight. So it was kind of a neat indirect way to conflict with players. 
And I thought a, a great way to do PvP without quite of the direct ranker would be something like that. So imagine if you had two teams of characters in, in a quest, and they're not in the same area, but they can maybe see each other in some fashion. And the environment spawns monsters out for them to fight. And the faster you kill the monsters, the more monsters the other team has to deal with. Kind of like yeah. how when you do Tetris versus Tetris, right? And as, I was just going to say that. Rows, <laughs> yeah, they yeah, get I... more random stuff. So the, So it's really testing the PvE skills of both teams, but there is a competitive element in that your success makes the other guy's job more difficult. Or, like, you disarm a trap on your side and the trap activates on their side and vice versa. And so you could have this sort of competitive dungeoneering uh, mm -hmm. type event. And I think that would be, you know, you could make it a challenge or something too, but I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, right. Kind of a neat... And I think just, that would work a lot better too. Uh, I mean, when you think about DDO, or just d d in general, the problem with PvP is that it's not really the way the game is designed. It's not really like the history and the community aspect of the game. It's mm -hmm. everyone against what the DM's throwing at you. It's not player versus player generally. Yeah. So you don't you don't really have that paradigm or kind of desire for a lot of pe people that are playing DDO because they play D and D in pen and paper to actually go out and play PvP. Yeah, and I think it's hard. You know, the mechanics don't balance well for it, and and the attitude can be kind of a problem for people. So I don't know. I'm glad it's there. Like I said, I I would never want it to taken out. I kind of like what we have, and you know, we did the tough man competitions, and those were a lot of fun. But um, yeah, you know, but yeah, if I had to choose developer time, I'd go the other direction. But I don't know. I think the challenge system could be used to to provide more competitive things, and maybe even some PvP like situations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I couldn't speak about any of this, uh, you know, officially or anything like that. So this would just be, you know, personal opinion time. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wouldn't want to offer a personal opinion as to whether I like PvP or not. That's just not really appropriate. But, you know, it would be interesting. I, I like the idea of the team-based PvP. You know, that's something that is not currently offered and, and might appeal to. Because, I mean, I think that would be ultimately the, the goal is there are those who like PvP as it stands, and we want to make sure that, that they're taken care of, you know, at least keep things on par as to what they are right now, right? So then the trick is then is if you were to do some sort of PvP enhancements, what could you do that would maybe be attractive to those who might uh, otherwise not be interested in that kind of development? You know, hey, I'd rather you spend your time doing X instead of PvP. Well, let's just say you were going to do PvP. What would it be that you want that you could get them in, interested in. And I think maybe, you know, team-based goal uh, play might might be it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe more of a, a game, so it's less sort of bragging rights, but more sort of, a, um, I don't know, treat it like I say, treat it like a board game almost, like a battle mm -hmm. chess or something like that. You know, a little more strategy, that kind of thing. Um, perhaps one simple thing would be to just have a PvP it on your guild airship, so it's just for guildies, and it's automatically set up there, right? That one might be fun. You know, you wouldn't want to PvP others, but you'll just hang around with your guildies and, and beat each other up for fun, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, cool. I, don't, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer to this. I'm just yeah. thinking off the top of my head. Well, a type of P, the type of PvP that would get me interested, because I don't like the individual PvP. Uh, yeah, I've, all, I've always stayed away from that in games, but the only type of PvP uh, that I've ever gotten at all interested in were the type of games where or they had a team versus team. You know, mm -hmm. maybe kind of like a capture the flag type of thing. You know, everybody's got to work together as a team to defeat the other team. And you know, I think with DDO and you know, just because Dungeons and Dragons in general, the way the game works, teams really need to work together best because. You know, you can't have, you can't really easily have one class against another class and have them matched very well. Yeah, right. yeah. So yeah, and that's you know, that's what they the did in the I Tough Man, which was really fun. Yeah, I love the Tough Man. I didn't take part, but I watched it. You know, I was they were just kind of hanging out and and uh, talking PvP with some of the people there. They they wanted to to give some feedback after running the event, so made sure to just sit back and listen, basically. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a really, really good time. It was really interesting. 
Yeah, it was a cool event, and they found a good set of rules to make the game kind of uh, to make matches take a little time and have a little bit of yeah. build to them. So you know, they they got rid of all the spellcasters, no melee attacks. It was like all bows and crossbows, but that kind of kept the the damage output right. at a at a speed where you know fights had a little ebb and flow to them, and you could be half dead and try to escape and and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, it was pretty neat. Uh, before Anne goes on to the next question, for those who want to see it, I'm going to try and do the monastery puzzle on my ah, screen. Gotcha. Oh, <laughs> cool. No laughing. This will probably end poorly, <laughs> but I'm going to go for it anyways. Yeah, we can keep that up while we, uh, Let, while we do the Let's watch and comment on it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. point and laugh. Ha, 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 ha. It, there may be some laughing here. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. No, no, no. Hey, if you're if you're able to solo it uh, with the, the panther there, and then get it done. That's pretty good. So I'm gonna attempt to use the panther as bait. We'll see how well that works. <laughs> Can you lock in his screen? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. That's it. I'm calling Peter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, panther, go away. Go fight somewhere else. <laughs> no dancing now. That's not gonna work. You know, I, I guess I would just say that I, I I like actually keep reminding myself every now and then it's like you know I really want to get back into it and organized uh, capture the flag sort of PvP pit. You know, one of the mm -hmm. ones where you can go in and set the parameters and that. That's actually a lot of fun. The few I haven't done it a ton, but every time I've done it, I've always had a really good time with it. I always kind of thought it would be fun to. To get uh, you know get the guildies and folks together and just do that again. So. Yeah, I think they're pretty neat. We used to you know when they uh, first had the uh, festival thing, we had a tradition uh, for the first couple of years in our guild where we would uh, have a coal fight. So the only weapon you could use in the PvP arena was coal. Uh, <laughs> to run around shooting each other with the coal until everybody's dead. Coal fight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, to strip off your armor and stuff so that you could actually hit people with the goal and hurt them. <laughs> I guess I will say that I have uh, broached the uh, subject of, you know, we should just get all the devs in a PvP pit and have it. You can beat up the devs tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty cute idea. <laughs> I like that. It would be a good Lamania promotion. <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you might find out um, which devs people have more of a problem with that way. <laughs> That's good. It's like one of those old dunking things. Yeah. <laughs> Got it? Yeah, it's down to two. I see. Now I always find the puzzle toughest when it's only got a couple open spaces, and then I have to sit there and kind of cogitate. Well, the trick here is you got to try and dance. What's his face around too? Right, yeah, because you don't want him coming down there and playing with you. Ooh, oh, it seems to have paused up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a little trouble trying to stream on it, uh, stream game footage. It just it, it occasionally kind of poops out on the frame rates. Yeah, I've, well, I've given our bandwidth. Yeah, so it goes. I think it's it's the dual upstream thing, right? Because you're using a lot of upstream bandwidth for both, uh, well, for for the Google Plus Hangout, and then also that. And so I think there's some syncing issues that they just need to yeah. work out a bit more with with G Plus yeah. Hangouts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's optimized for you know showing people's pictures, which change very little, but a game screen is going to change a whole lot. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, right. That's, it's a lot more for it to shove up the up the pipe. Yeah. yeah. TV has a better technology for that, but they require payment. I think we we're probably going to hit our time limit pretty soon, so let's do a couple more questions. Uh, if we have some. I got some. Okay. Yeah, just so you know, we, we did discover there's about an, uh, a, was I guess a 90 minute time limit on the broadcast. You can chat as long as you like, but the, the broadcast thing only lasts for a certain amount of time, so it'll huh. just kind of kill us uh, when the time comes. Ways to get longer broadcasting time, but it requires some sort of validation and like, so if you are an actual like official um, organization like Turbine, you will get unlimited because you've been validated. But for us, we're not validated, so. <laughs> but then again, you know, 90 minutes is... I think that's a good show length, yeah, so. Yeah, right. yeah. 
So. Okay. So let's uh, let's see if we can get in any more before. If it suddenly cuts off, well, I think that'll probably be the end of the show. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do a quick round of these questions here. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And ends digging through the chat. Ooh, puzzles. Oh no! no I'm kicking down to that one little one that's off to the side. Yeah. Almost there. I'm trying to think. Uh, I got any questions? I don't usually have a lot of questions. Uh, top three tips for making a druid. Uh, top three tips for making a druid. Uh, yeah, okay. Number one, decide what kind of a druid it is. Do you want to do damage? Do you want to be tough? Or do you want to... And if you're going to do damage, do you want to do melee or spells? I think those are the three kinds of druids. The spell damage druid, melee damage druid, tanky druid. Uh, so pick, you know, pick one of those. Uh, and then next up is... Um, I don't know. Don't short your wisdom. You, you need decent wisdom no matter what kind of druid you're going to be. It's pretty important for all of them. Um, uh, and then, I don't know. Anybody got another tip? Um, augment and summoning. Yeah? Okay. Because it helps your pet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you build to your animal I form? I mean, do you try to plan ahead to your like specific build goals with your animal preferred animal form in mind? Well, I think that's the thing is those three choices kind of inform your animal form. So if you're a tank, you'd be a bear. If you want to do melee DPS, you go wolf. And if you want to be a caster, then you're going to do the elemental forms or right. just human. Um, tends to roll in one of those. From uh, the, how about splashing? From, oh, there do you, you think that you should splash? You can, so what? Um, you can splash monk. That works pretty good. And um, I'm not sure anything else helps a lot. Monk is the one I like the best. Oh, I have a, a, a druid rogue. Uh, which is pretty good. That works. You can make a trapping druid. Uh, it's not an easy build, but it, it works pretty well. For expanding weapons. Yeah, yeah, you get different. We but most of the time, if you're a combat druid, you're going to be an animal form druid, and so you don't need weapons. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Doom. <laughs> I win. All right. Nice work. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> is how you do the puzzle, maybe. A solo. It's pretty impressive. Uh, I've never okay, done I got, I got a related one. If, you go with a, if you're doing a half-elf druid, what do you think is the best build time? Ooh, that's a good question. Rogue. I say, I actually, I think the, the rogue is probably the default. I think you decide why not to pick the rogue dilettante, <laughs> in my opinion. Because <laughs> you can't use extra sneak attack damage, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, certainly if you're going for the BPS on, on the Druid build, de definitely. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, if you're if a you're caster... If you're then that would be the way to go. If you're going to be a caster, I would probably pick a different race. Yeah, yeah, you'd probably be a different race. I've, I, uh, I, you know, I sometimes... It's not good, but at low levels, I do like to take the Artificer Dilettante sometimes and then swap it out later because I like... Repeating crossbows are awfully good low-level weapon on a character that otherwise isn't good at combat. Yes. <laughs> so it can be kind of a fun one to start with, and then if you want to feet swap it later with your free feet swap. I have to admit, you know, I've been uh, you know doing the LR thing, like I said to my artificer, and I recently took the dilettante. Um, oh, is it the shoot? Which one gives you the uh, divine power, Clicky? No, oh, I'm not sure. I can't remember which one it is. I've been doing that one though. Favorite soul, maybe. Yeah, yeah I, I can't remember which one it is. Sorry, I wish I was better prepared. Um, but I, I did that instead of the sneak attack because I found that typically with my artificer, you know, I do that junk, 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 and that would grab the aggro. So I wasn't really doing a whole lot of sneak attack damage, frankly, with my artificer. And so I thought it would, that having that clicky would actually come in handy, and so far it has. I mean, it's not a huge bonus, but you know, any especially as you get higher up here. You know, any, any extra points of damage you can do specifically to your base damage, you know, really can add up over time. So I have found it to be pretty useful. But. Hmm. Cool. Or not, not divine power. What the hell? What am I talking about? Sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always get those ones mixed up, the divine power versus divine faith, or uh, yeah. I don't know, there's a few different ones. Hmm. <sighs> divine favor? Right, right. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Divine... Divine favors the level one spell. 
Right, right, right. Yeah, the one, the, the plus one luck bonus to weapon attack and damage. Correct. Oh, uh, okay. That's the one I was looking at. So. Any more? Another question? And looking at her screen, maybe not. <laughs> has Has anybody uh, started using the tensor's transformation on any of their characters? I picked up some scrolls to play with on my uh, bard, but didn't really have great success with it. Yeah. That, and I keep forgetting to cast them every 30 seconds. Yeah, it is kind of short. I have it on my barbarian. I like it on him. Uh, he, he enjoys it. He doesn't cast real often. and He's you know he's kind of this short-term boost. You know, he's got rages and buffs and things like that, so it kind of fits perfectly with his character design. He can cast it pretty easily. Uh, sorry, just to, to make sure I actually am accurate here. Yes, the half-elf dilettante favored soul, which gives you uh, three uses of divine favor. I didn't even. I I guess I didn't even realize it gives you uses of divine favor. I have it on a character. I have favored soul on uh, my wizard rogue, uh, half elf. No, it isn't favored soul. What's it? Cleric. It must be the cleric. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know. Well, um, if you started your own tavern, this is from the Chronicle comment. Oh right. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start? Uh, start stand out from your competitors. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have all these taverns that I use in my D&D &D game. They're kind of like sit, fit, set taverns that I invent in one game <laughs> and I use them in all. Yeah, they, well, yeah, they got the nobles, the voice, yeah, yeah. So when people go to the nobles' choice, it's always a tavern in any largest city. Uh, they have a, a teenager that works at the nobles' choice. Says, Welcome to the nobles' choice, choice of nobles across the land. How can I help you on your delightful stay? Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the chain in, you know, that uh, that they have in every city, and they have, you know, poorly paid employees who are always, you know, threatened by whatever monsters or assassins <laughs> show up to, har to harass the party. They're like, there's there's a gentleman here to see you, sir. <laughs> I'm gonna go hide behind the desk, and uh, yeah. so I enjoy that one. Uh, nice. Uh, I don't know, actually. Uh. Old porcupine, and to uh. lure guests, I would offer them a month's worth of free stay if they could down the pickled porcupine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was invented by one of my players in a game once, and I've I've reused it a few times. Yeah, yeah. Big jar pickled porcupine on the thing on the on the bar. <laughs> uh. I, I definitely have to offer some type of a challenge for that would attract them. It's like, you know, come in, you buy this. You know, I don't know what it would be, but something. You know, if you can down a uh, certain amount of something, then you know, you, um, you, know, you get uh, you know, next night your second night stay for for your whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, here we go. I, I guess it could be tequila. You know, I can I can have uh, food through and serving. <laughs> It would be called the astral plane, and you would all be floating with Featherfall throughout the entire stay at your tavern, and people would take off <laughs> Featherfall and drop down to you and give you stuff. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Or you could call it the <laughs> film <Jump>. teleport. <laughs> film teleport. <laughs> you mages that teleport you to the top at the beginning of your stay. That's <laughs> great. I like that. Yeah. Also did one like you know if you have a gnomish bar and then the owners of the bar are always tinkering with little gadgets and things you know that are supposed to serve you but of course they yeah. go horribly wrong all the time but, uh, that's another good gimmick yeah yeah it's funny I lately I've had some uh, conversations with people about. Um, how they, you know, what happens in their role-playing games and, and certain groups, you get the group of players that just like to kind of sit around and talk and they're like, yeah, I'll spend all day with my characters in the bar ordering food and figuring out what they want and deciding what adventure they're going to go on and then they never go on the adventure. They just sit there and chat the whole session. It's like, wow, it's <laughs> totally different yeah. than my group. But. Oh, I remember in one of our D&D games, um, there was a magical door that was very, very cold and it was a just permanent cold enchantment on the door, so we stole the door and used it as a table to cool drinks in the tavern. So that would be a very good gimmick. Yep. <laughs> it was supposed to be a trap, but it was like the only magic item we could find in the whole dungeon, so we took it. 
It's like, this is a low magic game. Like, yeah, it's not low magic traps. You can freaking door. <laughs> We're taking that. Like, nothing else is worth anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, more questions? Somebody wants to win a prize. I mean, somebody. We can't give the Chronicle comment a prize. <laughs> as, as excellent as it is. Hmm. Oh, okay, no personal questions. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like we're close to 90 minutes here. Yeah, I think we're, we're coming towards yeah. the end. Okay, well, we can call it here. Um, this is left over, so... <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what. Uh, yeah, email us at ddocast at gmail.com. Uh, with questions. There with you go. questions that we can, we can save for later, and uh, we'll send you a prize so long as the prize is hold out. Cool. Right. Tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> cool. How are you going to give away the Menace of the Underdog code? Probably those who people submit questions, if they want to be entered in a drawing, um, please note it in the email. Yeah, let us know that you want to win. Because, of course, if you already have it, then it's not quite as useful. Although, if you have a friend, you know, you can enter and uh, give the code to a friend of yours, um, somebody who you want to play the game. That's always good. I thought uh, you were so going to uh, pick it from the out. people who ask questions here. Yeah, 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 that's the idea. Okay, gotcha. As well, yeah. but since we... There weren't a whole bunch of There these. weren't a whole <laughs> bunch, and I just want to make sure. I want to keep on. <laughs> we sure. Can, we can do that as well. I mean, there's a whopping five people. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, one of them could win it. There I mean, you have to say it. Yeah. I can win it. Well, we'll give the people who did it on, on, uh, on air an extra chance. So. Yeah. I could, I, it's 50% off right now. I could buy one. <laughs> no, we could always <laughs> and get an yeah. extra one out there as well. I don't really care. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody for coming on the Q and A. Uh, much appreciated. Um, just you know, we we wanted to do something this week, but we didn't have a lot of time to prepare. So this was a nice alternative, and it was fun to talk to everybody. So I like, I like the round tables, and I'm and in this sort of format. So we're kind of experimenting with the formats a little bit so that it's uh, we can have them more frequently and be a little bit more casual and the and just basically have it so that we could pick up anywhere at any time and run with it. Cool. Yeah, and if you end up listening to this, let us know if you uh, enjoyed it or were bored to tears or what. So <laughs> that'll influence a little bit how often we do it. Cool. Panel. Uh, you know, I got nothing. Uh, make sure to follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Google+. Plus. If you are listening to this and you're into Google+, Plus and you're not following Dungeons & Dragons online on Google+, Plus, please do so. We would certainly love to see you here. Uh, we're trying to do a little bit of sort of video and hangout work. Uh, Tolera and I and, and community team folks, um, you know, they're doing them on Locho as well. And uh, we're, we're trying to sort of utilize the you know, the social channels as best we can, but obviously a lot of it depends on interest. So if you guys want to maybe see more of that kind of thing, uh, make sure to let us know and follow us because the numbers help dictate a lot of the efforts that you're able to do for this kind of thing. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you're not on Lamania, feel free to, to join up on Lamania. It's free and you can see and get a preview of content. Uh, we do have patch two coming up and update 16. Um, I can't remember what the official announced data that is, but uh, by the end of the year, and Maybar is coming up too in October as well. So, uh, and we'll be finding out a lot more about Update 16, I think, within the next oh, I don't know, three four weeks, something like that. So, cool. stay tuned for some more information on that. Yeah, and Lamani is a great place to experiment with characters too. Uh, mm -hmm. I like to do that there. Yep. Otherwise, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate being on the show. I really love it. So. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, definitely helped with uh, some of the types of questions we get. <laughs> we're like, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know, uh, maybe something. Uh, so that was yes. Great. Speculate, uh, <laughs> hypothesize, or theorize to most of these questions. Yeah, so it's definitely <laughs> great having you here. Much appreciated. Yeah. How about you, uh, Greg? Any uh, last words? <sighs> Nothing really for me. <laughs> okay, Shamgar, basking in the glow of mechanical glory there. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Later, man. Uh, Paul Miller has one. We have one last question from Paul. Oh, last Miller. question. And, okay. And uh, what is your number one uh, TR prep tip? One per panel person, please. 
All right, uh, let's start with Gordon. Evan. What is the number one pro tip? Uh, TR tip. No, TR tip. Oh, TR, TR tip. tip. Uh, um, honestly, I'm not the right person okay. to ask right. the question. <laughs> we'll I, I, my, my, I guess what I would say is, is okay, here, here you go. Oh, we got one. Make sure that you've got, uh, set aside some armors for, say, level 4, level 8, level 12, level 16, level 20. Uh, make sure you've got plus uh, plus two, plus four, plus six stat items, and uh, get a couple of a uh, couple of the things that. Okay, so during your first life, right, you're going to be getting a bunch of loot, and you're going to be, man, I wish I had that a couple levels ago. Well, keep those in mind. Try to figure out what those things are, and then set those aside so that during your next life, of course, you can get them earlier and use them right away. Otherwise, I don't worry personally. I know people really get into their TR checklists. I myself am far more lackadaisical about that. I tend to just sort of go with what I have and not worry so much about it. So, uh, but, you know, those are, I guess, my tips. Okay. Uh, Shamgar? Uh, my recommendation would be to make sure the bottle of the scotch in the cupboard is full <laughs> and make sure you turn in your end rewards. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, it looks like Shamgar got dropped or something. No, 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 Shamgar. I mean, I sorry, Eckert got dropped. Yeah. Okay. Um, my tip would be uh, get a buddy. It, it, the TR grind goes a lot better if you have somebody to do it with. So uh, if you can coordinate a little bit with some people, uh, having a, a group of people TRing together is a lot more efficient than trying to pound it out by yourself. So that's mine. My TR tip is um, before you TR, run the Sharn Syndicate series so you can get the BTA or bound to account items and then use them for crafting because usually they're low enough and then you can trade them between characters. Cool. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay, I think we're done. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for everybody uh, submitting questions. Much appreciated in the chat room and uh, on the air. So. That'll be it for today's Q&A DDO guest. Thank you for our panelists for joining us. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Shamgar. Thank you, Eric, wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good Later, night. everybody.